This is a chat I had with Dr. Tawny Cross, who's another PT working in the field of persistent pain. She has fascinating outlook and perspective on pain, and it's really interesting to listen to other people's views as they're approaching and working with people in this field. She's really engaging, enthusiastic, fun to listen to, and I'm sure she's great with her patients, and uh, you might enjoy listening to some of her work and answers to the questions I post to her in this little chat. We're on. Tony, thank you very much for giving me some of your very precious time. I know you are a superwoman with <laughs> superpowers and a super mom and everything that we're going to find out about you. So I really appreciate your time. I'm interested in listening to um, some more about your work, mm-hmm. uh, about what is uh, your take on this persistent pain kind of paradigm that we're now seeing. Because uh, I've followed your feed and I'm really interested in the way that you kind of present ideas on it. And the people that watch this might be interested in it too. It's very engaging. Yeah. And um, I'm going to ask you a few questions that might be patients might ask and then catch you on the hoof and see what you feel about them. How does that sound? That sounds great to me. If you were in an elevator with a patient, you kind of you had a minute or two to s- suggest to them they have a potential for recovery. What What would you say? I would say that the human body is amazing and adaptable, and we actually don't always know their limits. That's lovely. It encapsulates the potential for improvement, doesn't it? Because uh, people often really tilt the head like a confused puppy when there's a potential to recover from something that they never believed was possible. And you must see that all the time in your work. And just say, tell me a little bit about yourself in terms of clinically what you are and what you see day by day. Yeah, so I have been working as a physical therapist um, for almost a decade now, and um, probably not as long as you've been working, Drew. I think your experience has been a little bit longer. Um, And I have primarily been working in a veteran's hospital, so I see quite the complexity with, um, with patients. I enter the field with sort of the bread and butter of physical therapy, which is stretches and exercises. And I assumed that would be kind of enough to address the sort of pain injuries that I was going to see. And me being as naive as I was, that was not the case. (laughs) It was very, very complicated. I would say if we think the average population has maybe 20, 25% of the population has chronic pain, within the VA hospital, I'd say it's closer to 75, 80%. So it's incredibly high. And what I was seeing a lot of was just people that were coming in, going through the same cycles, um, pain management doctors, uh, rehab doctors, ortho, neuro uh, specialists. No, nobody could figure out how best to help these people. And this was obviously like before even we started talking really much about the opioid crisis. Um, and they kept on funneling people into PT. And I would see the same faces again and again and again. And um, they they just weren't getting any better. And they're like, I don't know, the doctor sent me back to PT again. Um, so I wondered at that point in time, if there was something wrong with what I was doing, I was like, maybe they're not getting better because of something I'm not doing. I, maybe it's my manual skills. Maybe I need more magic fingers <laughs> or something like that. And so I, I started kind of exploring, um, continuing education on my own and like, what can I do? And, you know, like some of those techniques helped um, especially like, you know, dry needling, some of the cutting edge stuff. Um, it's like, oh, this is a new thing to try. This might be helpful. Um, but again, still the same cycles. And so it wasn't until I started to broaden my field and um, of what I could do as well as what I, could, I understood pain to be, um, did I actually start to be able to see change. Um, and for me, it involves, and I'm sure Drew, you see the same thing. It involves so many other things rather than just looking at the physical stuff. Um, yes. Movement is still important, um, but oftentimes the the people that I work with that are, are my colleagues, they're like, "What do you even do anymore? You don't you don't look like you're doing like normal PT stuff." I'm like, "No, it's, it's not." Um, the same thing. However, there's still very important movement components because um, the body works with the mind just as much as the mind works with the body. Um, but now I have a very integrated, holistic approach that combines different um, pieces of what's important in all fields. And I guess you've gathered those things eclectic, 
eclectically through that curious exploration of maybe uh, pain science or neuroscience or behavior change or trauma would I be right it's kind of you look down different avenues that are not classically the PT training physical therapy training they touched on them the, now in school maybe it's 25 years ago since I left university they weren't really touched on you were told of maybe a yellow flag or a few social psychosocial questions you know is the granny ill are they the main carer and what how many hours of work to the week they were very superficial yeah but actually that's that's that should be quite a fundamental part of all the assessments we do really do you agree oh absolutely in fact I I would say it's astonishing that we're still committed or a lot of people are so committed to some of the old, the older outcome measures and things like the modified osteoestry and like the lower extremity functional screen. And they're not necessarily using some of the more broader tools that look, look at fear and um, pain catastrophization. Um, and like the start Achilles start back to, I don't know if you guys use that as well. Um, but there's different measures that are better able to capture like what these person's needs are. If we talked about the Healy Starback tool, um, it does a good triage on like, okay, does this person um, benefit from standard physical therapy measures? Do, do this, this person need anything more? And usually when they score high, it just means there's a need, there needs to be like a higher level of, of mul multiple medical providers attending to their care in order for them to see success. Mm. And when you entered this new paradigm, and it is really a, the other side of the matrix, isn't it, from where you start, it's uh, you don't ab abandon all those physical tools and understanding of movement and physiology because they're fundamental to, to fundamental additions within this other realm. Um, but did you see results change? Yes, actually. Um, and this is this is. Maybe hard to like give as a like a results-based thing because chronic pain is tough right it's it's been there for people for at least a few years to 20 to 30 years so we don't expect to un undo things so what we're looking at um in the beginning isn't necessarily like a pain change because i don't know if you see this through but like people will come in like oh if i just do this thing then my pain will change and i'm like no this is this is what we're shifting here part of the shift is we we're working on things that in the long haul will change pain but what we're interested in first is changing like little bits and pieces in your life that will start to um, improve quality of life so what i would say when i look at um, things that um, i'm working on people it might be quality of life changes um, if they're starting to work towards their values um, rather than um, you know obviously like if you have pain you're like i can't do this can't do that and you whittle yourself down to doing very little and so people have essentially, I call it um, a reverse carrot stick, where pain is whacking them forward in life rather than act them actually going towards something that they, they want to do, something of value. Um, so quality of life changes, um, how they're living their life changes, pain ultimately starts to decrease. Sometimes it changes for people really fast. Sometimes it changes very, very slowly. Um, I'm looking at how well they connect and talk to their mind and their body. I'm looking at mood levels. So those are all the pieces that I'm measuring over the course of time. Yeah. So it, rather than being a win or lose, I do this, it works or it doesn't. You do that, it works or it doesn't. This is a process you're engaging that might have some meandering through, but um, we're looking at a variation of experience through that that is 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 uh, not just following the emotion of the pain, if you like, as a as a barometer of success or failure. Subtle yeah. nuances around it. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, obviously that's your day-to-day -day practice. Do you work privately outside of that? Do you see clients online or through Zoom? Because I can put links to your website and feeds and other bits of pieces if anyone is interested in kind of connecting with you, if you're allowed to. I don't know how it works with your state or locality. but Yeah, I actually have people um, in my private business. I have someone right now that it's like work. I think she's based in London. I don't know for sure. I have to ask, but she's in the UK. Um, and, and so my group coaching stuff is, is totally my own thing. It doesn't really fall under traditional physical therapy. I, I would call it more coaching than anything else. Um, if, if that helps people with understanding like insurance, like usually insurance doesn't necessarily like feed in too much by way of health coaching, coaching, as far as I know. Um, but yes, I absolutely see people on the private um, level and um, I have found that growing for me as well as exciting to do um, just 
as an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, and that's a nice uh, avenue alongside, uh, call it bread and butters, maybe a little bit disrespectful. For it, it isn't, every patient's important, isn't it? But it's nice to have some uh, growth that's kind of beyond the norm. It's certainly a, an offshoot and an unusual, although it's becoming more usual now. Um, it's nice to be, uh, somebody was asking me the other day, how do you how do you see yourself? And I said, I'm, I'm certainly not a pioneer because I'm kind of just interested in this stuff after I'd heard about it. So, but I, I, I would think I would describe you as kind of an early adopter. Would that be fair? Yeah, I would say you and I are probably in the same same field and that shape. Like we're standing on the shoulders of giants before us, um, but we're um, we're definitely not in the conventional medicine world anymore. We're we're sort of uh, maybe we're in the front 25% rather than the top 110% yeah. of people that yeah. are developing some of this stuff. Yeah, and it doesn't really matter, does it? No. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's a fun place to be. It's fascinatingly, and maybe you see this now, that category of patients that were always almost felt a little bit untouchable, either through uh, you might have thought it was you, or I might have thought it was me, and then we might have thought it was the patient. Well, actually, now we're happy to sit in that unknown space and let's see how we get on. Yeah, yeah. Without any predefined pressures to for it to work or not, it's not about that moment. It's it's a, it's been okay in the unknown and, and attempting to kind of challenge beliefs and predictions and uh, movements and perceptions, and it's all integrated, isn't it, with a wide variety of techniques that suit some people and not others. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I think that you kind of hit it on said like being open to, um, I would say some of the newer things that we're working on is, is more of a collaborative space for certain, because even though we might be the experts on pain or experts on movement, um, people are always the experts on themselves. They're going to know what ticks for them. They're going to know how their body's responding to something, um, even if we might be able to invite them to explore that on a deeper level. And so if we're expecting something to quote work, unquote, um, then it's got to come from a, a place where they're telling us, you know what, I've tried this before. This is what came up for me. And, um, and then we kind of talk through, okay, well, like, what are the reasons um, we may have met with resistance there? And like, how can we do this better? So yeah, it's absolutely more explorative rather than this, like, I tell you what to do. And if it doesn't work, then it's either on me or it's on you on the technique or something like that. Yeah. Can I shift the focus to you a little bit now, sure. uh, rather than your patients? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this is this is related to a post you did three or four weeks ago. It fascinated <laughs> me. It was all the disadvantages that somebody can presented be presented with, and yet mm -hmm. despite them all, still recover. Yeah. You remember yeah. the post? I do. I do remember the post. Thank you for reaching me out to me about it. Actually. <laughs> So just list some of the things that are classically seen as predisposing factors for those that haven't seen the meme or the post. Yeah, um, so lots of predisposing factors. Um, women um, and um, I would say kind of more minority folks tend to actually have a higher um, number of, of risk or higher number of risk factors, that's a risk factor, higher trend towards um, persistent pain and chronic disease, poor social economics, um, if you came, grew up in a poor environment, if you grew up in a poor social setting, um, if you have a history of trauma, um, if you have um, prior um, repetitive injuries and you're exposed to environments where like, the, like you had medical trauma there, a doctor told you this or that, um, there are actually an incredible number of risk factors. And I would say of the things that I, I listed, um, they, I, I can't remember how, I didn't really remember counting, but I had a lot. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I, um, I think that's what you were, you're getting at there, right? I was, yeah. So even though lots of people can have these situations predetermined, in fact, or predispositions you like, it doesn't define that they will get persistent pain. And even those that have had the perfect Pollyanna kind of moments in life, uh, doesn't make them immune either. It can happen to anyone, can't it? It can. It really can. Um, and maybe to some extent, like there is less, so they call them risk factors for a reason, right? They, they say these are trends and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's set in stone that just because you have this thing, you will inevitably 
fall apart <laughs> at some point in your life. It, but these, what I call them with patients, it's almost like the perfect storm. The yeah. perfect storm. The stars align sometimes when life takes off in a great way for you but sometimes the stars align and that, it, maybe it's a philosophical one or it's just there's a, there, there appears to be a set of circumstances that feel overwhelming in our lives yeah. and th- why that moment in time maybe that's when we went to learn or find those resources within us or whether we can overcome them or not is just a challenge to face but that's the moment often when pain appears isn't it or yeah. disease or the symptom of something that appears to be disease that actually isn't that yet. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the way that I describe it, um, we we use like tubs and faucets to, to sort of address this. I don't know if you've ever come up that analogy before. Oh, describe that to me. Um, so in the conventional medicine world, um, obviously we're, we have been historically focused on like the physical stuff. So yeah. that's you know, your ankle sprains, your rotator cuff tears. And Drew, you know, probably as well as I do that of almost only half the population maybe will show up with symptoms with sort of that type of stuff. And so we're missing something if we're not capturing half of the population. And so if you can imagine your body and your nervous system as a tub, as a, as a bathtub, and it's a very fancy bathtub. So it doesn't just have one faucet. It has the physical stuff for sure. Uh, and we also know that when we're sick, we don't f- perform physically well. Um, if we have a piece of toast, we're supposed to run a marathon, don't have enough fuel to get our bodies going. Um, if we have um, allergies and it's pollen season, um, if we are in a bad mood, all of that impacts our physical um, physiology, physiology, our physical health in some shape or form. So when we think about this bathtub and we have the physical faucet, yes, we wanna consider the herniated disc or the supposed diagnosis of some disease or another that's not an actual disease. Um, but we also wanna consider, consider, okay, what else is pouring into this bathtub? Is it like the history of the trauma? Is it the social economic background? Um, all those things combined will actually add weight to the tub, right? And the overflow at some point in time is usually a symptom. Now, if the water's overflowing down into the floor, let's say it's pain, because most of the time when you and I see people, it's about pain, that is the symptom. Your nervous system, your body is trying to tell you, oh my gosh, I'm overwhelmed. This is crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. Please help me. And most of us are fixated on, let me wipe the puddle off the floor. This this pain is awful. Like, you know, let's inject it. Let's let's put a Band-Aid on it. And pain itself is guiding you to the fact that your tub is a over is overflowing and maybe what we should be looking at are those different faucets start to work on those things and then we can actually have a long-term change rather than desperately trying to clean up the water on the floor yeah and i suppose that uh that kind of faucet or bath analogy is easy to identify in those that categorically acknowledge that they've had trauma you work in a kind of veteran hospital so by definition they've suffered some physical or emotional trauma or both so how about when you're dealing with people that don't really consider that they've had any trauma yeah so it's interesting because I think that when people think of trauma they're usually looking at these big scenarios like has there been some sexual trauma has there been something overt that I remember and um, sometimes you can't remember. There's obviously people who, who have disassociated um, or repressed memories. they like, I just don't remember big periods of my life when I was a kid. And that's your nervous system and your body being protective. Like, why don't you have those memories, right? And, but they're, still, they're, they're very reactive to certain things. So something in their system is remembering. Um, and that doesn't need to be the whole thing. Like I have people that I know um, th- that I work with as well as like friends and family that like, you know, I don't, I don't have anything that huge in my history, but when you look in the history and this probably goes into some of the risk factors that um, I, I listed is, is like little micro things. Like you had a very authoritarian parent um, where you weren't allowed to do anything or like they weren't physically abusive, but they were very verbally abusive or they were like somehow emotionally withholding. They didn't foster some of these needs. Those are all considered um, micro traumas that can build up over time. Um, and it, what it comes back to is just, is your nervous system shaped in such a way 
that it can handle these loads. And if you've been, whether you call it trauma or not, if you've been taught differently, if you haven't adapted enough to learn how to do this in a healthy way, then yeah, it will show up in some shape or fashion. And you don't have to call it trauma if you don't want to, you can call it um, but they, they do differentiate micro and macro traumas and micro traumas tend to fall along the lines of things that don't quite seem to be like your traditional um, trauma histories. Yeah. So have you heard it described like capital T and little t? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Capital T, little t. And uh, so trauma, capital T trauma is what we probably all describe as if objectively heard that somebody had a car crash or was abused in somewhere, we'd all wince and think that must have been hard. Yeah. Yeah. The little T stuff might have been um, you dropped your ice cream when you were little and you were shouted at by your parent who was a bit upset at the time and you really wanted the ice cream. And in some way that's encoded as you're not good enough carrying an ice cream or whatever. It's not a big thing. It's just the child's needs in that moment weren't quite met. Yeah. Oh, they interpret it. So they had to behave in a certain way to kind of accommodate that. It's a tiny little thing, isn't it, in reality? But the child encodes that moment because you can all remember being embarrassed or saying something silly that isn't that significant. Yeah. But that's I think that's interesting when sometimes in later on in life, the pain comes with a small twisted ankle or a, a relationship breakdown that's a friendship breakdown. It's not divorce, but it might be a, a small amount of trauma and yet the recovery just doesn't fit the logical pattern yeah and i think the explanations you give there is that it really gives someone some meaning to their experience and as soon as they have that they realize that they're not as badly damaged as the first thought and they're not as broken as they believed yeah absolutely like all those things that happened like yes your system was like responding a certain way and it was actually interested to adapt to help you survive better. And if those things are no longer needed anymore and you're able to teach your nervous system that, then your system is not married in stone. Um, I don't know if you follow Greg Lehman at all. He's, he's yes. a, yes. yeah, I think one of his three things that he writes is like, that like your nervous system is adaptable. Like the only qualification for it, for it to adapt is if you're human, because if you're like, or, or you're like, because if you're dead, then you can't adapt. You're, you're alive and you're human. Those are the two qualifications for adaptation. Yeah. I think sometimes with patients have a very adapted nervous system that's got them some, uh, lots of social rewards through pushing through and social praise and putting the emotional needs of other people first and attending to others, like a career in care, for example. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, when there's an unpleasant experience for that person, they, they, there's a risk that they default to those behaviours because that's what they've always been praised for. So it's differentiating, isn't it? The sensation. Yes. Say, okay, this is one of those times when, yeah, you can deliver and push forward and push hard, but sometimes there needs to be a, a, a readjustment to that default. Yes, yes. And that's dis that's discernment, isn't it? Giving the brain and the body some different tools for that sensation rather than catching themselves in this reactive behavior that might be contributing to their pain. And I think that pause, getting them to pause from the defaults and interact in a way that just puts a gap between the, the um, trigger and the reaction, I suppose, is where we find this, you and I maybe find the space to suggest. Yeah, for sure. Else. I think, I mean, I, the way that you're describing this, I'm sure to, you, to your folks, um, is, is that we're always... Un, like we don't know this but we're under all, autopilot most of the time right our days are um just shuttled from one end to another we're not really thinking about what we're doing we're just doing it and everything that we do is particularly um reactive right like someone yells at me i react back i'm not thinking about oh look i'm reacting right now <laughs> like or like i'm i mean everything is reactive and if we are on autopilot we actually it sounds weird but we don't have a choice we're not actually making a choice to make this response, to make this decision. And until we can pause and realize, oh, this is what's happening, um, then we may not have the ability to break outside the bubble. Yeah. And it's a very efficient way to work, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Very fast, very reactive, fight, flight, freeze, fall, the fastest way to feel safe. And uh, I described to patients that um, we're just going to show you a different way to feel safe. You don't have to not feel safe the other way. You're allowed to use that 23 hours, 58 minutes. That's my classic line. I said, I'm just asking for two minutes. How does yeah. that sound? 
Yeah. And if they don't like the sound of that, they shouldn't be listening to my voice. They need to come and speak to you. <laughs> or it maybe just comes with like being able to recognize that in the beginning, like it's not going to feel good. If you've spent your entire life being a certain way, that new thing, even if it's two minutes of belly breathing or something, it, it might not feel good. Yeah, exactly. It looks dangerous. Safety looks dangerous. Yeah. From the perspective yeah. of the unconscious mind, it looks yeah. strange. You know, we like familiarity. It doesn't matter if it hurts. Yeah. I mean, that's why people might find themselves continually going back to these like habits and like, how, they have, how come I can't break the cycle? How can I break this thing? Your system's looking for familiarity and knows that. Yeah. It looks for it. And it's not their fault, is it? No. It's blame not. doesn't come into it. It's not about fault or blame. Or, it's about can, can develop the ability to respond differently. Yeah. Yeah. And then having that conversation is kind of quite honest and human. It's a, do you want to change this? And I might be able to stand alongside you as you do it. And, you know, we'll, we'll have a go with this, but um, you don't have to do it on your own, but you will be on your own at some point doing this. Yeah. That doesn't sound scary, can't it? Yeah. I think can that. I, can you I know. ask you some questions from yeah, like a pa patient might ask? Sure. Yeah. Catch you on the hoof. So uh, why does it hurt when I move? Why does it hurt when you move? Yeah, uh, so typically speaking, your nerves are very responsive to anything that you do or anything that you sense, whether it's temperature, to stress, to your thoughts, to movement. And um, you're asking from the perspective of someone who has persistent pain or acute, it doesn't matter. Persistent pain, yeah, yeah. Persistent persistent, all of these persistent pain. Okay. Um, so what happens over time is because your nerves, your body is trying to help you be better in some shape or form, trying to protect you from something, it can start to sensitize. It can start to become more reactive to small things. So um, for example, let's say if you were to walk a mile, instead of your nerves saying, hey, you walked a mile, it believes you walked a hundred miles. Or if you sat on your butt for five minutes, everybody has had experience. I mean, maybe not everybody, but I have <laughs> at least sat on the toilet for like too long and you get that numb and tingling, right? That's normal, it happens. But if your nerve is sensitized, it can sit for five minutes and it will think that it has been cut off from oxygen. So it is going to hurt because it's gonna ring an alarm in your system and your system's like, whoa, don't do this thing. This is, this is not feeling good. And it will feel very painful. Great answer. What's that? Great, great answer. <laughs> Next one. Ready? Yes. Why then, when I'm not even moving, Tony, I'm not even, I'm just sat in the chair and I get a flare of pain. Why does that happen? Yeah. So it's kind of the same process that we just described. If I were to go with the same person that I'm talking to from the last question, <laughs> um, it's just that your nervous system is sensitized, right? So if you're not doing anything, then you're not actually injuring tissues, right? If you're sleeping, if you're watching TV, and you're not physically moving that much in enough to change a tissue, then your nerves are in this very hypersensitive state and it can react to next to nothing um, as well as be its own, I ha, it ha, almost has its, uh, it beats its own drum. In the medical world, we might call this neurogenic inflammation where there's a backfiring in the nerve. And what we would say to that is, um, if you tap your elbow and you feel the zinging into your fingers and you also feel that you're tapping, right? So we know that nerve, um, nerves talk both directions, down to your body as well as up to your brain. And over time, what can happen with a very reactive nerve is they don't need you to have any stimulation to that area anymore. It can decide to just send you a little zing even if you're sitting reading the most pleasurable book whatsoever. Yeah, great, great. I, I sometimes when I there isn't any physical thing for the person to see. Um, do you see it where sometimes you, they might wander in their thoughts, a prediction of uh, tomorrow, or think about yesterday? Do you see that influence on people ever? Where they sat still and I said to them, "What, what were you thinking about doing, or what were you thinking about? What you think? What were you feeling at the time? Do you ever get them to consider that idea?" Yes. Yes, I, I work a lot with thoughts and emotions um, 
nowadays more so than I do about the physical things, although I still do the physical stuff too. Um, and I would kind of go into the idea of like, let's pretend, you know, you just got kicked in the groin, right? Ooh. <laughs> when you think about that, you're already preparing yourself to respond to this thing, even though I'm obviously not able to go through cyberspace and kick you in the groin. And anything that we do, if we're watching a movie and we're seeing someone else get hurt or seeing something sad happen, our system is reacting because it's recognizing what's happening and it's preparing, it's organizing our muscles, our joints, our nerves for that same sort of reaction. Um, that's why we can empathize with people as well as we do. And so thoughts and emotions don't necessarily come from nowhere and they come from nerves, right? They, they come from our bodies, our brains. And if you have a thought and you have emotion, then sometimes for people that already recognize this, they say to themselves, like, when I'm stressed, I feel more pain, right? The stress also doesn't come from nowhere. The specific thought, the specific thing that drove that stress. And if that is driving what your nerve is feeling, then you know that your nerve is res unusually responsive to your thought and your emotion. Yeah. And those thoughts and emotions, we don't have to be conscious of them, do we? Yeah, no. Like, um, I would say like 10% of our brains is conscious and 90% 90, 90 is not. And um, when we say subconscious, like sometimes, I, I don't know if you see this, sometimes people are like, no, I'm always aware of like what I'm doing. I'm like, oh yeah, like, so are you consciously controlling your breathing the entire time? Are you consciously controlling your heart rate? You're like, yeah, yeah. what are you feeling? Like, oh no, 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 no. I'm like, yeah, that's all subconscious. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, those analogies are really important because people think they are controlling every element of the life. And I say, are you controlling how long you grow the hair on your head compared to how you grow your hair on your legs? That's because I'm sure you'd be, you wouldn't be very happy if your hair on your legs was as long as the hair on your head. <laughs> well, I'm sure that'd be interesting to see. A nice winter coat. <laughs> yeah. It's that universal intelligence, isn't there? That you, it, it sounds a bit fluffy. And, but when you think of heart rate and breathing rate, well, breathing rate you can control and override, but you know, lots of bodily systems that are happily going on. At a, a rate of, of, of interactions beyond the stars in the galaxy. And we, we really... We, we're just struggling to string sentences together most of us <laughs> yes absolutely for sure well i do some days right last few questions where do i start then okay so this is a diff totally different paradigm to what i've believed for 10 years Tony, where do i start so it kind of depends on i would say what you're most comfortable with because what would work for you like if i like if i were to just tell you what to do um i have not found that to be very beneficial um so i would want to know which area we want to focus on. If your intention is like, Tony, I, I think movement is something that I'm interested in working on and I'm committed to. And that seems less intimidating or scary than working on emotions or mind or meals, which also can play a part in our nervous system. How on what, sorry? On? Meals, like food. Oh, like sorry, yeah. Our yeah. Bodies. yeah. Then um, we could start with movement. Um, so it kind of goes with um, a lot parts of, what you're interested in doing as what you as much as like what you think would be give you the most bang for the buck or what might be easiest for you to do because any change that we make is going to be new and sometimes the smallest change that we make can freak your nervous system out and i'm interested in making sure that we're going at a pace that is uncomfortable because we do because adaptation only occurs in our level of discomfort um but not so uncomfortable that you're like i'm never gonna see you again and i want to punch you right now yeah and so, <laughs> Oh, the way yeah. you're presenting that's lovely because you're basically saying there's routes that will suit you wherever you want to start. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll metaphorically hold your hand whilst you explore it. But I'm going to kind of guide you somewhere you might not like. But yeah. I'll be with you as you do it. As you feel uncomfortable, let's, go, let's get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yes. Yes. How long will it take? How long will it take? How long do you want to be with me? <laughs> okay. Um, how long will it take? Honestly, it depends. Like, it depends on what you want to work on. Like, all of us are always in a state of, getting better like even though i may not have chronic pain um i am working on different things about teasing on my uncomfortable borders and let's say i take you to a point where your pain levels are low and you're feeling so great um you can still make a choice like is there more to work on and you can continue on there um but i would say in order for adaptive change to occur Practice frequency needs to be consistent for at least a few months for you to be able to uh, measure that change and we're 
just to go back to maybe some things that we talked about in the beginning, we're not measuring pain directly. We're measuring other areas of life that matter to you. And if you're seeing improvement in those areas, it depends on, again, what you're working on, but, um, and how frequently and consistently you practice. Yeah. And I think when you broaden the uh, horizon for consideration of where someone's at and, and not focus on just the pain, they might present to you and say, do you know, Tony, I've just been able to pull my trousers up or I've walked to the shop and I can't believe it. I was, I'd got there and back before I realised it doesn't hurt anymore. Yeah. You know, yeah. Or I've sat in the chair chatting to someone on the phone. I've never been able to sit that long. Yes. Yes. It yeah. almost happens to us by when they ex, the least expect it to happen. It's already yeah. happened. Yes, absolutely. Like it's it creeps up on you, like the changes that you make. Um, and it's it's if you're trying to like watch it from day one, it's it's kind of like the watch pot. It's gonna take. It feels like it's forever. Um, sometimes I do also like people to know just from the get go how long, like changing the way your system has been quote wired unquote does take. And, and I don't know if you've used this analogy before. Have you ever seen the backwards brain bicycle guy? Yeah. Yeah. Me so that too. like, and for, for those that haven't like seen it before, um, it's a backwards brain bicycle. When you turn left, it turns right. When you turn right, it turns left. The concept sounds simple. And most people that are attempting to ride this bike would say it would take me no time at all. It would take me two weeks to be able to ride this bike. And on average, the adult would take eight months to be able to ride this bike. How many? Eight months. And that's a long time, right? And that's not even talking about pain stuff, which is much more complex in my opinion. Um, it's talking about being able to ride a bike and go from left to right, right to left. And if we think about that in perspective, why are we trying to see a change within a week or two of doing one breathing practice? Yeah, and I think that's where the busy mind problem solving fix it more tries to hijack some of the really healthy and uh, helpful approaches. It quickly it can quickly get hijacked. Yeah, absolutely. And people say, oh, this exercise won't work. This breathing tech doesn't work. This talking therapy doesn't work. This, But it's the intent with which often people approach it without realizing they've been hijacked doing it. It's just yeah. almost it's, uh, kind of, you can't see the wood for the trees. Yeah, yeah. Final message, Tony. I've loved all these questions. You did, you did good. <laughs> I didn't realize it was being tested, but I'm glad I'm scoring well. Ah, uh, well, it's just, it's nice to catch you on the hoof. And just, this is it's quite authentic. It's, you're very natural and uh, honest. And uh, I think it'll shine through. So um, last, the last uh, pitch, if you like, for to somebody, the final message that uh, maybe hope or inspiration, what we just said, someone who's kind of still looking curiously at, at some of this information. Um. So some hope and inspiration, um, and they're coming from the perspective of they're thinking about this. They've listened to you a little. They've listened to me, mm -hmm. and they're thinking, mm -hmm. yeah. What would you say? Just um, would you say anything else? Yeah. Um, so generally speaking, I would say like if they're if you're at a place now where you feel right now something different, you're opening up to this new idea, that is a sign of change. That is a sign of adaptation. You're not a closed book. You're not a stone. You're not rigid in your setting. And we know that doing things differently versus the way that we've done before will help you have a different result than the same result that you had before. So if you're open today to even just hearing the message, like you've already made a huge step forward. Oh, well, Tony, you are. I knew you were a superwoman. <laughs> oh, I just nailed it. <laughs> Thank you for 41 minutes of your precious time. I hope you have a lovely day. I look forward to following you some more on Instagram, and I'll put the links of where people can watch you if they're interested, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Drew. And I look forward to staying in touch. You too. Have a lovely day. Cheers, Tony. Take care.